So as I've been building out my 286 system, one of the things that I've been keeping in mind is how can I most easily expand the system as I move forward. One option is the ISA slots that I've been working on adding to my system board for 286. But there are other ways that I'd like to support adding on functionality to my system. And in this video, I'm going to walk through ser Serial Peripheral Interface. Uh, so Serial Peripheral Interface is a convenient way to allow essentially my 286 to be a master device and to communicate with and send data to and receive data from many other devices, uh, often referred to as slaves or SPI slaves. There's really four signals that I'm going to be working with as I get into this. There's a serial clock, so my master will have to generate a serial clock that the slaves can basically use to know what data to be reading when. Uh, there's a master out, so that is the SPI master device. What information is it sending out? MISO is I have a slave device that wants to send something back to the master. And I have chip select. Which slave device am I going to activate from the master? And I can only have one active at a time, and that is done from the master. So in my case, I'm going to have my 286 system be the master. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a second. For my initial work, I wanted to come up with some way to do SPI testing that is still pretty simple. And so for my first SPI slave, I'm going to use a little display that looks like this. It's an eight digit, seven segment display that is driven off of SPI. Now in this case, this display, I can only send data to it. It does not send back any data, which is fine. So this is really a, a half of the equation. Later though, I might add SPI devices such as an SD card or some flash ROM that is connected through SPI. And I think I might actually try flash ROM next. And that might be one of the next devices I use as an SPI slave. But to get me going, I thought this would be a simple little device to at least see if I can make this work. Now, as far as the SPI master, I mentioned it's gonna be my 286 system. As far as the master is concerned, this is the device I'm going to use as the master. It is from Western Design Center and it is a 6522, which is a versatile interface adapter or VIA. And I'm going to talk more about that here as we move forward. And I'm going to start out by comparing it a little bit with what I've been using up to this point, which is this PPI. So I have a pair of PPIs. I have one that's doing PS2 keyboard input. I have another one that's doing LCD output uh, and also a little speaker. And these work great and I'm still learning about these. I, I'm far from having everything figured out on these, but I, I do have them to the point where they are functional for those, uh, those devices, the LCD, the speaker, and the keyboard. But the 6522, again, is from Western Design Center. And I copied this out of the data sheet for the W65C22S, which is the one I'm using. And so it's a versatile interface adapter and basically it comes with two ports. And what you can see down to the lower right, on the left side of that chip, the lower side of the chip, there's two ports. They're each 8-bit ports. To the right, I have things to let me control the addressing like RS0 through RS3 lets, lets me choose which register I'm going to select. And I'll show you that uh, in a little bit more detail here shortly. Uh, there's a reset and there's uh, obviously uh, I need to get data to it. So there's eight data lines, there's a clock, there's some cable select, there's read write type of signal and then support for interrupts. Now the reason I'm going with this one is I've used this one quite a bit in the past and one of the things I really like about it is I can control those port pins individually as if as far as if they are an input or an output. My understanding on the previous this PPI I can only modify those in groups of four, four pins. I can't say make this pin an input and the pin right after it an output and the next pin an input. 
And so I lose some of that control and I want to have some of that control when I get into how I'm going to set up my SPI master. So I'm choosing to go with uh, this 6522 instead. Uh, I, I'm sure we could argue that uh, you could go either way and get the job done and I, I'm sure that is true. But I also wanted to see, could I bring in some chips that typically, I think this is true, typically weren't used with the 286. This was a chip that was more used or is used with the 6502 or 65816 type of system. But there's really nothing that stops me from using it with the 286. And maybe some of you have used this with the 286. I shouldn't assume that that's not common, but it, I don't see a lot of it out there. Now, as far as this chip, it has a total of 16 registers and so I've got to work on you know how do I get to this chip first of all what IO address am I going to use and in this case I need 16 IO addresses that I can work with it and so this is how I'm doing the decoding I'm basically going to go from 20 to 3F and I don't actually need all of those locations but I do need to go all the way to to 3C so I'm going to go from 2.0 to 3C. And you can see that if A5 is 1 and 7 and 6 are 0, and I know that this is an I.O. type of, of activity that's going on, I can then use that for input NAND gate to give me my signal that I'm going to use to activate this via. Down below are just some, some comments I had put into my assembly code, but basically Within that via, there is a, a set of three pins so that allow me to set what register, you know, which register am I, do I want to work with. I want to write some configuration to it or write data out of it, in, read in from it, etc. And they give all of these different ports. And I'm not going to go through all these ports right now, but the first couple allow me to control, for example, am I going to have a pin on my port be an input or an output? And then the, and, and actually, sorry, that would be the DDRB and DDRA. So for port B, I want to basically define which pins are ins and outs. And then for DDRA, same thing. And then the first two in the list, port B and port A, are what I can actually write to to send something out of those pins or read something in from those pins. But this kind of gives me my addresses, 20, 22, 24, 26. And you'll see in the schematic that I'll show shortly that I've shifted all of the address lines so that I'm reading evens only. Um, but these will be the addresses that I will read uh, for evens only. And so on my schematic, as it continues to get built out, this is where I added in the via. And I'm just calling it via number one in case I decide to add a second via later. And this is the configuration of how I am actually wiring it up. And so there's a, there's a bunch here, and maybe let me point out a few things. So first of all, there are two ports. So there's one port here that I am not using at all at the moment. And then there's this entire port that I am going to use for the purpose of SPI. And with it, I've, I'm going to say that this is my MISO. So that's an outbound port. Uh, sorry, MISO is an inbound. Uh, my mosey is an outbound, the clock is an outbound, and then all of these are outbounds. And these are different chip selects, of which I only need one of them right now, which I'm going to choose to use this one, chip select one. And so I'm going to have four, four signals that will give me my SPI support for that little display that I showed. And these others can be used for future expansion. And then I brought in my address lines. Again, I shifted it so I'm not starting with A0. I'm starting with A1 through A4. And then I have my data lines. I, I brought in my, I think it's called the peripheral clock on my clock generator setting up here. But basically, it's the same speed as that internal processor clock. I'm bringing in IOWC so that I know whether I'm reading or writing. I'm bringing in a reset, which in this case, this reset is an active low reset. Now, you might remember that coming out of this clock generator, there's a reset, but it's an active high. So I'm basically going straight from my reset card, not choosing the active high, but choosing that active low that comes off my reset card. 
which I think is fine. That, that's not going to be a big deal for now. And then I need a way to actually say that this is this via is enabled, and that's with a chip select. And to get to that, I'm going to run it through a latch. So if I back up, I've gone into my PSOC, I've added this support, I have this new pin or this new output telling me whether or not the VIA should be enabled or selected. I've run that signal through a latch and then that latch is coming into this here as this CS2B and the other CS1 is another one of these enabler chip selects and I've just tied that high. So I'm entirely controlling whether this chip is enabled or not if I'm, if I'm writing or uh, reading from it based on this CS2B coming out of a latch which is coming from my PSOC. Then I had to get into a little bit of assembly code and I defined a few things here. I used some of those ports uh, port 20, 22, 24, 26, and 3C. Uh, 3C is going to allow me to control whether or not I want to pay attention to interrupts. There's different types of interrupts, and I am going to, at least to get started, say turn off all interrupt support on the chip. Uh, these two ports, the DDR ports, allow me to again configure uh, if I'm going to do a read or a write on a pin. And then I can actually read and write those pins through these two ports, port B and port A. And then I said, okay, let's define just some friendly names. So uh, MISO is this pin, MOSI is this pin, S clock is this pin, and then I'm going to use CS1 as this pin over here. And I left you know, these other four set up that I can use at some point if I want. So right now, the way it sits, if I change nothing, I've got support for five SPI devices. Now I could easily take three of these pins and run them to a three to eight decoder and then get eight control signals coming out plus the other two, which would give me 10. Or I could go use that entire port, the other port that I'm not using and do the same thing and I could get up to 33. So this one via will let me control up to 33 SPI devices if I add some three to eight decoders uh, to, to support it. Or I could say that I have five now, I could use the other port of eight and I would have 13 SPI devices just with the VIA all by itself, which is more than I will use in this system. So I should be good there. And then I came in here and created a really simple little initialization routine and a procedure to write a byte through SPI and to read a byte through SPI. And then to support that LCD, that little eight segment or eight digit uh, seven segment display, I created a little routine that allows me to do that uh, a little more simply. And I'll walk through these in detail here coming up for those that wanna keep watching and see some of that detail. Now for the SPI communication, one of the things that you have to figure out with any of these devices you might use is not just the basics of SPI, like how do I, how do I actually send an SPI signal, but also what are the specific, I guess, commands or the data, the registers I might leverage on one of my SPI devices. So first thing, you know, I had to go in here and, and make sure that I could just generate the appropriate signals over here on the left. So could I uh, generate the appropriate select signal? So that might be my CS signal. And can I generate the clock signal and the MOSI and the MISO signals? And this is actually an output and I'll show this in a video coming up that you can see me uh, basically going in and debugging a little bit with a tool. But this tool is just showing me that I have uh, a basically a chip select and, and as you're seeing the chip select here it's low this entire duration and it comes up at the end over here and you can see that I've got a clock going up and down and I'm basically pulsing that clock so one two three four five six seven eight you know try to pull in my eight bits of serial data uh, MOSI is what am I sending out so anytime 
basically that the uh, clock shifts it's going to read you know so the clock goes up and it says okay you've got uh, a zero you've got a zero you've got a zero and if mosey is high it says oh you've got a one there and in this case i can see that i've got a hex six that i'm actually sending and then miso is anything that would come back from the device and and usually if i send a byte of data it will then follow on the next byte <clears throat> in the response i'll get back from that spi device plus i could be sending another set of data so i can send data and be getting the response from my previous whatever information i sent to that device now to simplify this this is why i chose a device that i'm only going to use mosey i'm just going to send data i'm not worried about getting anything back it's not going to send anything back because there isn't even a, a wire connected for me to get something back from this and that's why you'll just see I, I'm always going to read back zeros as I get into this. But all of that timing is kind of stuff I've got to get figured out. And, and I have it working at this point. I'm going to show that to you in, in a video coming up. And I've done this with uh, maybe an SD card, reading an SD card. And that's a little bit more involved to make that work. But it's the same same general idea. I just have to make sure I know how to how to set these signals. And you'll see in my code, it'll make it a little more clear of, of when and how I'm setting these signals. And if, if you want, you can maybe dig through my code that I have so far. I doubt it's perfect. And I know that my SPI communication can be cleaned up a bit yet. And I'll continue to work on that as I move forward. But if I got that basic, I still need to get over to my, my little display and understand how to work with it. So what I tracked down was the data sheet for the driver on the little display. So if I back up on the back side of it, there's a small IC and that's this IC that controls those digits. And so what I need to make sure I can understand, first of all, is what IC is it? And it's this Max 7219 and it is an LED display driver and it supports SPI. And so I can see a pinout and stuff like that down here. And I'm not so worried about that, but I can get into this data sheet and there's a, a lot of good information. And I want to dig into that data sheet here just uh, momentarily, but that'll let me understand really what format is it expecting data in. So yeah, I can put data out through SPI and uh, it can receive it, but am I putting the right data that means something to that device? You know, so every SPI device I use uh, is probably going to have a different set of information that I'm going to have to understand to work with it. So maybe what I'll do at this point is just jump over to a few of these data sheets or a couple of these data sheets. And so you can go out to the website for Western Design Center and you can grab this or just, you know, simply search the internet, a Google search for uh, W65C22S as an example, and you'll get to this document really quickly. But I can read through this document, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but here it talks about those registers. In my code, I only had 15 of them listed. Here you can see there is a 16th one, this uh, register number F, and uh, I'm not doing anything with that. And most of these I'm not using. I'm using, I think I had five of them on there that I'm using. I'm using the uh, first four along with one of them to set interrupt information, IER, which is register E. But I can go through this and I can understand the format of all these things and the timing and how to set up interrupts. And this is a pretty capable device and I've got a little bit more experience with this and, and I do like to use this device. But I can get to the pinout and understand that pinout and that's the same screenshot I showed earlier. So if I got the basics of that kind of figured out, that's part of what I'll show you in code. And then I've got the actual display itself. And, and more importantly, it's the controller, the driver for the display. And this document covers two of them, a 7219 and a 7221. And I'm using the 19 and basically they do comment in here. Let's see if I can find it, that they're pretty similar other than there, there's a difference uh, in slew rate. Uh, and that's on the 21, which I'm not using. And, but they also say that the 21 is fully SPI uh, compatible. So uh, the one I'm using is not technically fully SPI compatible, but uh, it, it is gonna work in the way I'm gonna use it here for SPI. And you can read the data sheet if you wanna learn more about that. 
But with this, I have to understand what are my registers. So if I scroll down, I'm not worried about the pinouts because on the little display, it's got you know the specific pinouts I need. And if I go back to my PowerPoint, here you can see I have a ground uh, right here. I have my VCC. I have my S clock. Here is my essentially my chip select and there is my data in. I don't have a data out. Then there's the shutdown register. Uh, so when I first turn this display on, it's in a shutdown mode and I'm gonna have to tell it, I want you to come out of shutdown mode and go into normal operation. I'm gonna also tell it that I want to do this code B decode for all segments, codes uh, segments uh, seven through zero. And uh, there's information about that coming up so I can see that, okay, here's this uh, seven segment character and which character do I want and I can see what data I'm gonna have to specify if I want that character and it shows me what segments are on things like that I can look at my intensity so if I want to choose the register for intensity I'm gonna have to send it one of these patterns to change the intensity to a certain level I'm going to use level 17 out of 32 levels of intensity and these four bits don't matter if there's an X but then I need to have a 1000 for those bottom four bits and that would set intensity 30 of 32 it would set it to 17. Uh, I can tell it if I want to only have digit 0 or all the way up and use all the digits. I'm going to use all digits in the demo I'm going to show you here in a little bit. This is helpful, this table one. This shows that what I'm gonna to have to send it in my SPI data. So I'm gonna to have to send it eight bits and another eight bits. And the first four of all of that, it doesn't even care about ever. But then I'm gonna to have to give it my address. So what address and that's which register am I choosing. And then I have to give it the next eight bits that's gonna configure whatever for the register. And that's what I was just going through some of those examples. And you'll see that in my code here coming up. Okay, so there's there's a lot there. And what I'm gonna do at this point is jump over to my code. And so in my code, uh, I can scroll down. As a reminder, I've changed my memory addressing. So my memory map, if you've watched previous videos, I now have my RAM taking 640K, ROM taking the 256 top, of my address space and leaving room for some video in between. Uh, if I get into my data section, I have added some stuff. And first of all, I've added all of this here. And so I've said, here's a friendly name for port B for my VIA. It's at that address, port A, DDRB, DDRA, and IER. So this one's gonna let me uh, read and write to port pins. And that's gonna be on port B. The next one is gonna be the exact same thing, but port A. Uh, this one is gonna allow me to configure, oh, let's just say read or write on port B. And the next one is the same thing, but port A. And then if I use this, this is gonna allow me to uh, modify, as an example, modify interrupt information, such as which interrupts are processed and which are ignored. This is where I defined uh, which pins am I using for MISO, MOSI, the clock, and then my CS1, that's the first one that I'm gonna use and I'm not using these other four for now. And then in my code, I'm gonna skip through most of this. This is stuff I've shown before, talked about before, but I call a, an SPI init and that SPI init doesn't do anything uh, too fancy here. Uh, this code is code I've had in my previous 6502 or 65816. So this is that style of assembly, but I just put it in here to kind of remind me, but this is that code translated to x86. So I'm gonna basically say, I want to have these three bits as outputs. 
and move that into AL and then write that out to DDRB. Remember that was a configuration port. So that now says that out of the eight bits, the eight pins for that port, these three are outputs and the others are gonna be input. Because I didn't set the others, that'd be zero. So, and remember this goes up above to help me understand which pins. So take those three pins, uh, well, this pin, this pin, and CS1, next one, make those be output pins, but let this pin be an input pin is essentially what that is doing. And that's one of the reasons I like this. 6522 is I, I have that flexibility. Uh, so then I am gonna basically get to the end of that. I initialize it, that really isn't doing much. It's just telling it which pins are doing what. And I get down then to this uh, main loop. I've, I've enabled interrupts and the loop just sits here and spins basically. Uh, previously when I hit the escape key, I did some processing on the math coprocessor and that's what I'm gonna basically uh, latch on to here. So in my math coprocessor testing, when I press the escape key, I added some code down here at the bottom to also do some SPI work with, the, with that display. And here's how it works. So I'm gonna basically move into my full A register, and this is, this is great, uh, coming from the 6502, I didn't have a 16-bit register, I only had 8-bit registers, so I had to do this a little bit differently. But here, I can just say, here's the register I want, and here's the value I want for that register. And so the first one I'm gonna set is the decode mode, and I'm basically gonna tell it that I'm using this code B, which that's how it's gonna decode and, and translate the whatever I give it for values into something on that little display. Uh, and then I'm gonna say send that command to the LCD. And then I'm gonna change the scan limit. That would be this register here. And I want all of my segments of, well, not all my segments, Want all my digits to be enabled and then I can set this register which is my intensity and I'm going to set it to this value which is that 17 out of 32 um, so about half brightness and then I'm going to go to shutdown mode and choose normal operation now you might want to put friendly names in for all this this is just how I put this in here for now and I grab these values from the data sheet just here's the value of the register and with that value here's how I want to set it now these are pretty static I'm gonna use that code like you see it most of the time and it's not going to change but then this code is what's going to what's going to be different uh, in a lot of cases this says go to the first digit which is on the far right of the display, and put a zero in it. Go to the next digit, put a one. Go to the next digit, which is digit three, and put a two in it. Sorry, digit two, they call it, and put a two in it. And those are the ones I'm gonna use all the time now. So I can go pick a register. I don't have to hard code the value, of course. I could be reading that, for example, from the output of the math coprocessor, and then write it out to that display. So that's gonna happen if I press the escape key. So then I've gotta figure out, well, what is this send LCD doing? And send LCD looks like this. Uh, basically, to make this work, I have to go to this Mosey line and I'm gonna to have to uh, modify it and, and have it basically be brought up. So Mosey is gonna come up and then I'm gonna also have to make sure I bring my select line down. That's an active low, so I need to bring this uh, chip select for my first uh, device, which is this little display. I'm going to bring it low, and then I need to write out information to it. And this is where I'm going to write out the basically the high byte followed by the low byte. And you can read through this code if you want, but basically this is going to write out the high byte. This is going to read out the low byte. And then I need to turn around and bring my select high because I'm done work, working with that device now. I've sent it, it its byte of data, or in, in this case, uh, two bytes of data. Uh, and then I also uh, keep Mosey high. So this says bring Mosey high, keep it high. And this would have gone low up here for CS1 and then high for CS1. So that's how I'm controlling that CS1 signal. 
And so anytime I want to send a word or two bytes of data, a register and a value, I can just put it into AX and then call this and that will get it sent. But inside of this now, it is calling write byte. And so I have to make sure I understand what write byte does. And I can show you what I wrote inside of that. Let me scroll down. Here is basically what it's going to do to write things out. So I've got, I have to tick the clock eight times and work through my bits and get that put out for uh, the, the SPI slave to read. And so I just basically run through a loop. I say run this loop eight times because I've got eight bits that I'm going to use. I am going to use the carry flag. So if I have a byte of data, I'm just going to be shifting it left. And as I shift it left, basically that's going to take the, the far left bit and shift it into the carry flag. And then I can just say, you know, if it's if it's set, if the carry flag is set, I need to toggle my mosey. If it's not set, I am going to skip toggling the mosey. So that's how I'm going to set mosey high or leave it low, basically. And then I also need to uh, modify and, and send out my my clock. So my clock will go high. The next time around, it'll, it'll come to a low when I write out to this uh, port B. Uh, but this is allowing me to, to control that that clock in addition to the mosey signal as we go here so what this is doing is just allowing me to write eight bits of data out to the spi slave device or put it onto the spi bus i guess if you want to call it that and i have a similar read i've not tested the read yet so i'll have to get a different device to to do a some testing of the read like I said, I might do a flash, some flash memory that is SPI capable uh, since I have some of those. Uh, but same type of thing. This is going to basically go out and say send 8 bits. And basically all I'm going to do is toggle the clock. And as it's toggling, I'm going to get back the response from the previous 8 bits I would have sent. Um, so that's what this code is doing. And this code should be pretty close. And I'll get this posted. And any of the stuff I've commented out, like this whole block, uh, that's that's going to be stuff that would have been 6502 or 65816 assembly. Um, and I just put it here because that's what I was using on those previous builds. And I've been trying to just kind of bring it down into x86 so I can kind of compare how the different assemblies are working. So I think that's about it as far as this assembly is concerned. Uh, like I said, I'll get this posted. Check the link in the video below. That'll get you to my blog and I'll have this code link posted for those that want to kind of peruse through it. It's not done, but it's it's to the point where it is working. So I'm going to flip over here now and show you this running in the system. And here's the system. So based on what I was showing before, here's my VIA. Here is my SPI display that I'm using. And here is this logic analyzer that I'm going to be showing in just a second. Uh, so at the moment I am using this oscillator for my output. It is a 24 megahertz, meaning 12 will come into my board and the processor will use half of that, which is six. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the system on at six megahertz. There is my default prompt. My, uh, you heard the post speaker likely I, since I uh, added that little amplifier there for it. And now if I press the escape on the keyboard, there is the math coprocessor test. And you can see I also did those SPI calls that we looked at earlier to actually populate this display. I thought it might be kind of neat also to look at how I can troubleshoot and debug this SPI uh, communication. I would say that you really do need a tool if you're going to do this bit banging of SPI like I've been doing. My oscilloscope has four channels and it supports debugging of or doing logic analysis of SPI. But this software that I'm showing on my screen from Digilent, I find way better. Uh, it's just, it, it's pretty easy to use. It does a pretty good job of uh, decoding uh, what it's catching coming from these signals. So I've just tapped into a ground and then the four signals for SPI. I've got my chip select. I have my MOSI, my MISO, and then of course the SPI clock. And you can see here, uh, this is showing on the screen those four signals and which pin I have it connected to. So I've got it connected to 
four of the pins. I'm not using the high speed inputs over here, which I probably should be for this if I'm going to do this in the megahertz. So I'm using just standard I.O. and not that, but uh, I'll just drop my, my clock down a little bit here and make it easier on what I'm, I'm going to be testing here. So what I'm going to do is uh, switch my oscillator, basically the output here, instead of just going with the halved output, I'm going to cut that in half. So I'm going to go with a quarter output. So this is a uh, 24. I'm going to send a 6 in to my system. Processor will run at 3. And I'm going to go ahead and just reset it. You're going to hear that the post will sound different because basically it's running at half the speed. And that will mean that my frequency of my notes will change and the duration will change. Okay, now I'm at my prompt. I have this. Uh, up here, as far as showing my, my screen again, you probably didn't see it change because it was already up there, uh, but it did basically go through and reset all the registers on that. And on the screen, I'm going to go ahead and start running this logic analyzer. And with the mouse wheel, I can change my rate here. And I'm going to zoom back until I get that where I can actually see it coming across the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the escape on the keyboard and then try to hit stop and catch it before it comes back through another sweep on the screen. Okay, so I hit escape and then I hit the stop and on the screen now I can zoom in and this is probably hard to read and I'll zoom in further in just a second. But what you're seeing is that full sequence that I was showing in code earlier, starting with a, a hex 9 followed by an FF, the hex 0B followed by 07. And as I get all the way towards the end here, remember I was setting values for the different positions. So basically go to uh, position 8, go to the 8th character on this or 8 digit on this and put a 7 in it. And that's what you can see there. And to the left of that, go to the seventh position and put a six in there. And so I can actually check out, you know, is this doing exactly what I what, what I want it to do? Am I seeing the correct select uh, at the right timing? Am I seeing the clock the way I want to see the clock? Is my output data correct? And that's what I'm seeing up here. And if I received back any data, what does that look like? And I'm not receiving anything back from this because it doesn't even have a data out. There is no MISO here. Uh, so all I'm going to ever receive back is zeros. And technically this device, uh, like I mentioned earlier, doesn't even properly uh, use the um, the full SPI like it should. Uh, there's a, a that other similar chip that we could use. Um, but anyways, this is showing on the screen then what's going on. So when I'm debugging, I can now look at this and see, is it is it thinking I'm sending the values that I think I'm sending? And if they don't match, then I can debug that. And I was running into some of that earlier. I was doing some debugging, and it ended up I was reading the wrong, uh, the wrong data in a byte in my assembly. And I could quickly see that I was getting one byte that looked right and another byte that didn't look right. And it ended up being a, a problem with my uh, stack pointer the way I was using it. But handy little tool. And uh, if you're going to do this type of stuff, I would recommend a tool like this or an oscilloscope that supports this a type of uh, protocol debugging. My oscilloscope, it has four inputs. It can do SPI, basically logic analysis. But I just find that this tool on the screen works better. And it's a lot less money than what my scope is. So that, that tool, along with this, uh, if you keep an eye out, they have some, typically some pretty good prices on this uh, from time to time. Uh, so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.